you and welcome everyone to the Migrant Leaders Connect Conference. This is actually the first time that we are holding our Connect Conference virtually. Uh, back in 2019, we held our conference at our, one of our sponsors' offices, um, Anglo American, who kindly hosted our last Connect conference in 2019. So this is the first time we're holding this virtually. And um, as a result, there are some advantages. Uh, obviously, uh, we can potentially get more people to join our conferences virtually. And we have tonight the privilege of having Anne Wilson, who is the head of careers at Warwick University join us to talk about strengths and why it's important to find your natural talents and to perfect those um, strengths and capabilities. We have Trudy Bateman, uh, who is a director from the company Capfinity, who specialize as experts in strengths based development um, and their tool, um, the Strengths Profile Assessment, which as a result of our partnership with Capfinity, migrant leaders will be rolling out and offering to all our mentees and mentors. We also have our engineering mentor extraordinaire, uh, Giovanni Sobrero, who was a production leader at Rolls-Royce and has recently joined as an area manager uh, in Amazon. So Giovanni will be sharing his um, remarkable uh, fast track engineering career story with you guys. Um, we will also have um, a large number of our mentors from a variety of companies, such as Smith & Nephew, Sienna, and many other companies, and all sorts of functions and roles that our mentors hold um, here in the conference to answer any questions that you might have about a specific sectors, a specific companies, about roles, or any general questions you might have about your careers. So I will be directing those um, questions to mentors mentors who may like to answer them. So um, I will, um, without further uh, ado, like to um, show you our exciting agenda by sharing my screen. Just bear with me. One thing I should uh, mention is that um, in the fourth section uh, where we've got workshops, we're going to keep everyone in the same room so that um, everyone is able to ask questions as they wish, rather than breaking you into sector workshops. And uh, at the end of it, we will also have a general Q&A session. But I first wanted to tell you about a little bit about my own story and what I think is um, my key strength and actually how I discovered it. Um, Today, I'm in my 40s, married with two wonderful children, and I have spent a really enjoyable, rewarding career, plenty of ups and downs, but a very rewarding career as a finance and transformation director for 23 years in companies such as GE, News Corp, and Ernest & Young. But life wasn't always this good for me. Um, really, at 18, I was just a young migrant Growing up in Birmingham, my family had broken up. We had plenty of typical challenges that migrant families face, uh, lack of uh, money, visa problems, broken family, lack of know-how, lack of connections. Um, but I knew one thing, that the way I was gonna get myself out of that situation was gonna be through education. So um, I knew that I need um, the British government to count me as a home student in order for me to be able to go to university. I was willing to work in shops and restaurants and sell things, teach maths. I was willing to do all that to earn money and pay for my expenses, but I needed help with my tuition fees. So I camped outside Birmingham City Council offices for three days in a row until somebody was convinced to count me as a home student. And a few uh, years later, having qualified as an accountant, I landed my first big break as a financial controller in GE. The reason I'm telling you this story in the context of strengths in our Connect conference is that if I had not gone through those hardships, I actually wouldn't have discovered my real gifts, my real strengths. If you had asked me as a 10-year-old, um, what are your real strengths and therefore what kind of jobs will you be doing, I would have told you, put me in a lab or a library. 
because I loved reading and I loved science and maths. So put me in a lab, that's what I would have told you. But since then, because of the hardships I went through and the people I had to convince to support me, sponsor me, advise me, mentor me so that I can do the things that I did, I discovered that actually I really like working with people. And I really enjoyed the purpose of helping solve other, people problem, of other people's problems. So that told me that I need to select a career that not only uses my analytical skills and my process skills, but also that it really involves people and business. And if I had not gone through those difficulties, I wouldn't have discovered that. Now, we're trying to bring you uh, this capability and this ability to identify your own gifts and strengths earlier than I discovered it and a little bit more scientifically than I discovered it rather than by accident. So that's why Migrant Leaders has got a partnership with the company Capfinity, uh, where we are bringing all our mentors and mentees the strengths profile assessments. And Trudy Bateman will kindly be talking about that later. So without further ado, I would like to pass um, the stage uh, to Anne Wilson, who is the head of careers at Warwick University, one of the fabulous Russell Group universities in, um, in the UK, who I am also a, a proud alumni of. So Anne, if I may, I will pass the stage to you. Thanks very much indeed, Ellen. I'll just set up my screen for a few slides. Okay, so welcome. It's, um, I'm delighted to be spending some time with you and thank you very much, Alan, for um, inviting me. Um, I'm going to be delivering both this first session and then I'm sharing the stage with Trudy a little bit later on. And the session that I'm um, delivering with Trudy, we're going to look in a little bit more detail specifically at the Capfinity profile. But what I wanted to start with was um, looking at your strengths, or as I like to call them, your superpowers. So having an understanding um, of, of your, your strengths or superpowers and what you can bring to the world. And Ellen has nicely touched on, on her unique ones and we'll kind of unpack some of those, um, those ideas around strengths as we go through this session. Um, it's really insightful. Um, we all have something to give in this world and we all have exceptional qualities. You may already be aware of some of your own you'll certainly be able to bring to mind people that you really admire and who demonstrate some of these special qualities, perhaps a relative, a friend, or, or somebody in the public eye. And it can be helpful to think about what specifically those individuals do or how they conduct themselves that make you respect or admire them. Um, we might want to have some of that magic dust that they sprinkle on other people um, or be in a position to have an impact on others in the way that they do. And I'm not thinking of, of transient things like fame or, or beauty. Um, I'm thinking much more about behaviours, values, authenticity. So people being themselves, not trying to be other people and shining and radiating something about themselves um, in, their, in that authenticity. Um, so those, as uh, Len Waif, an American screenwriter says, those are the things that make us different. Those are our superpowers. So strengths are unique to you and you are different to everybody else. And that's a really important aspect of strengths. I thought it might be interesting to actually pick up on a particular role, uh, role model at the moment. He's Marcus Rashford from Manchester United has been in, in, in the press a good deal in, in recent months. And for me, Marcus Rashford is somebody who really exudes a whole range of unique strength and I thought it might be fun to do some strength spotting around what he'd done but essentially um, he's not just not just not just a Premier League footballer but someone who's made a real difference to the lives of others through the Covid experience and used his uh, position to influence others in a really positive way to raise awareness of an important cause the fact that many children were going hungry in the UK and he's shamed the government into providing the funds to ensure um, that this was addressed and also got many of us making contributions ourselves to this, this very worthy cause. Um, and so there was an element about Marcus Rashford that made him very compelling, a very compelling young man because of his own unique story growing up. He remembered very well himself um, when he was young being hungry. And so he could really relate to that, that feeling. 
So I thought it's worth looking at the strengths that Marcus uh, Rashford demonstrated to illustrate that, because I, I saw these as his strengths in action when he was going through this process of trying to persuade the government that um, we should be giving more money to people who really, really needed it at this difficult time. He really had a clear notion of what his mission was and what really mattered to him and what was important. He was very focused and very clear about what his aim was. He had a clear sense of equality and wanting to level the playing field for people so they were no longer hungry. He was very persuasive. And so although he therefore had backers and people behind him to help him raise that his profile, nonetheless, he was very persuasive in terms of um, getting people, winning people over. He clearly wanted to improve the lives of others and make things better for them. And with that also went compassion and that courage of kind of stepping out of his comfort zone, perhaps, and putting his reputation on the line to fight for something he really believed in, and that persistence to push for the thing that really matters. And so that, com that combination of strengths, not just one strength on its own, for me, makes that selection of superpowers and Marcus Rashford somebody that really, really stood out. So I think what's really interesting is that we all have a story, and sometimes telling our stories can actually help us unpack and find our superpowers. So later on in the session with Trudy, we'll actually be having a look at how you can, if you haven't already done it, complete a questionnaire and get a unique insight into your own personal strengths, but actually reflecting on your life to date and what you've been through helps to give you an idea of both the strengths that you, you may not have recognized that you even possessed, um, but also gives them some context as well in terms of how you've actually demonstrated them. Um, so some of our life experiences will, will shape and our experiences will also shape us. And early influences play a longer term role in how we develop our superpowers. So we're going to explore some of those now. So some of the things that might give an, in, an insight into the sorts of things that really motivate us and, and um, point towards some of our strengths might be things around the games you played as a child and what perhaps excited you about that game. What kind of role did you play within the game that you chose? And what qualities did you perceive yourself as having? And was this something that you played on your own perhaps or with other people? So I'm gonna ask Day, who's very kindly um, said he will share an example of a game that he played when he was younger and give us some contextual example here. So Day, would you like to, um, to share that with us please? Um, hi there, um, my name is Vegetia. Uh, I'm an intern for Migrant Leaders. So a game I played as a child in high school was cricket. Um, I quite enjoyed playing cricket um, with uh, my team in year 11 and year 10. Um, we ended up winning uh, quite a few games, but hopefully um, I get to get, get to do that at university as well. Um, the thing that excites me the most about the game is um, the teamwork, the, the way uh, everyone has different roles that they can play to um, put us in the winning situation. And the role I played in the game was a bowler. So I come in when the team is fielding and uh, it's, uh, it's a unique role where um, there's a lot of stress um, on an individual to um, perform. But uh, as a team, there's a lot of support around you. So within the practice um, practices and off times. Um, there's a lot of support where you can practice and improve your skills with other bowlers, which they can get, where they can give you pointers in, on your bowling skills and so on. Um, I, um, I had skills in the fast bowling um, type of um, style um, where I bowled fast rather than a spin style um, and that helped me uh, secure a place in the starting lineup uh, because it was a unique skill where I was able to um, get a lot of um, influence on the game with my bowling style and this game is definitely a huge team game so um, again it's the team effort that counts more um, even if I do put an excellent bowl in, it's that the team that I rely on to make the field in um, happen. So um, in that scenario, um, that's the type of role I played in that game. Very much indeed for sharing that with us, Dave. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. 
Moving on from games, we're also shaped by what we read and what we watch. Um, so does anyone have a favorite book, film, TV program that they would like to share and say why? Um, anything that you immediately think, oh yes, it takes you straight back to childhood, something you really, really loved. So have a think about that one for a moment. Um, so when you were growing up, what was your favorite book, role model, TV or movie character? And what was it that you liked about that person? What were the characteristics of the person that you admired? And how did you feel when you were watching or reading stories involving that person? So when I was growing up, um, I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty outgoing person most of the time, but as a child, I spent a lot of time with my head in books. I just love novels. So I was always reading, always in the library, always borrowing books, um, always novels. Um, quite often about girls or young women overcoming adversity in order to succeed. So some of this probably sounds a little bit cliched, but Jo March in Little Women is one of my favorite all-time heroines. Um, but later on in life, what I discovered is this, these sorts of narratives and these stories of, of, of women in particular overcoming adversity um, resonated as I got involved and was keen to join different organizations or clubs or parts of, of, of companies um, where I, I was interested in addressing disadvantage and supporting and championing the cause of women, whether it was women returners wanting to get back into the workplace following a recession, whether it was um, supporting young women develop. So I'm a, a, what they call a sprint trainer at Warwick. So supporting um, uh, undergraduate females to um, make the, the, the best of their, their learning opportunities and develop the self-confidence and stretch out of their comfort zone in order to, to succeed and achieve. So that played to my particular strengths of improver action and optimism. So there was a kind of little link there with what I was drawn to, with what automatically felt like things that I wanted to get involved with or do. So thinking about these questions and your own stories and your narratives, moving on now, um, let's look at rules. So how you're brought up will have an impact on what's important to you. What are your family rules, spoken and unspoken? Because often these can influence the life choices that you make. And some choices may be seen to be acceptable or unacceptable, for example. And you may choose to actively rebel against your rules. And I asked Ellen to see if she would come up with an example of a rule um, to share that with us. And she kindly said she would. So Ellen, share your example, if you would, please. Thank you, Anne. Um, I, I would say that... Um, some of the rules that apply to my family um, will resonate with some of the many of the mentees from migrant leaders who come from ethnic minority families, because even though um, my family's story is quite unusual in that my father came from a very deprived background, grew up in a village in Azerbaijan in Iran, and his village didn't have running water, electricity, or even a school. But through his academic ability managed to improve things for the next generation. Um, so I was very much um, growing up from an aspirational and academically strong family, but I still felt uh, restricted by some of our family rules, not because I wanted to rebel, but because I think my family had very fixed ideas about what they called respectable careers. <laughs> so uh, the options given uh, not only were limited to doctors, engineers, um, lawyers, financiers, um, and that was pretty much it, but we were generally told that you're good at maths, so do finance because it's a female-friendly um, profession. And actually, I wanted to do science. I wanted to do innovative things in science. Um, and uh, I didn't perhaps have the courage to challenge my family. Uh, and I always, often, not always, but often did as I was told. Um, so uh, those were some of the rules um, that governed what they considered respectable um, careers. And uh, that that doesn't unfortunately always play to your strengths. So uh, I would advise young people, first of all, um, before you challenge anybody, collect data, collect knowledge, collect information about what your true strengths and gifts are so that when you do challenge someone uh, respectfully and you do it uh, 
with knowledge and uh, rationale and that you can have a constructive, helpful conversation with your family regarding how applicable some of those rules might be uh, to your future. And so that, that's primarily what I would say about my family rules. Thank you very much, Ellen. I think it's worth adding as well that certainly it's very easy to make assumptions about what's possible and what's not possible. And of course, we listen to our family and they love and care for us. So they are strong influences in terms of the choices that we make. Um, but there are some things that people may not be aware of. So that, for example, the majority of graduate recruiters do not mind what your degree subject is in, unless it, they, it's for a particular technical role where they must have engineering or something very specific for a job match. But many graduate jobs don't require a particular degree. So a lot of the conversations, for example, that we have at Open Day, um, I remember Open Days, the real thing. Hopefully they'll be back in, in situ again soon um, with parents looking at me, nodding over their son or daughter's heads saying, should she do philosophy? Or business studies, for example, and the the, uh, the son or daughter looking distinctly uncomfortable. So I will always try to unpack from the, the, the prospective student, what do they love and what energizes them, what genuinely motivates them and where are they going to feel the buzz from the subject and put most passion and energy and effort in. Um, because ideally, if you're in love with your subject or really, really enthused by it, you're going to put so much more in and subsequently get a great deal more out as well. And of course, at university, we can support you in actually developing employability skills, regardless of the discipline that you, you decide to invest in. So I just thought I'd mention that as a, I can't help it, I have my career's hat on so much of the time, it's difficult to let go of that. So I thought I'd mention it. And anyway. I, should, I should go off pissed, um, I should go off the plan for just one more minute, because there's a story that I ought to share here that's really, Please really do. relevant. So, um, I mentioned that um, that my family said that I should do finance because I'm good at maths and finance is a female friendly profession. Uh, I can tell you when I discovered, uh, even though I've had a career in finance I, I, and I really enjoyed it because I moved into uh, management positions uh, from the age of 25. So it used a wider set of skills and capabilities um, and was business oriented, which I really enjoyed. But I remember my first lecture in my finance and accounting degree as an undergraduate. That's the moment I discovered I shouldn't be doing an accounting <laughs> degree because it was uh, it was an accounting lecture. And uh, I I took about half the lecture passionately arguing why marketing costs should be capitalized rather than expensed. And. And I remember the lecturer saying, but this is the rule. Marketing costs should be expensed. And I passionately argued that marketing adds to the value of the brand. And later, the company is going to earn revenue from this. Therefore, it should be capitalized. It must be capitalized. And I'm not accepting this rule. It's illogical. <laughs> so I remember the, the, the accounting teacher asked me to stay after the lecture and had a chat with me saying, you will not be a financial accountant. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's the moment I knew that if I'm going to pursue finance, I had better become a financial controller and financial director pretty fast so <laughs> that I, I can use my, uh, use my other capabilities because I wasn't going to make a particularly good accountant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, now I'd like to introduce um, James to you all because James has very kindly volunteered in order to kind of give us an illustration of when you take a bit of time to reflect how the story's gone for James so far and what he's learned from, from, from his life to date. So James, would you like to, to share your story with us, please? Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say, I hope everyone's having a great evening so far. So introduce myself, my name is James. I'm from Derby. I'm also a marketing intern at Migrant Leaders and I've just finished studying business management at Pearson Business School. Um, I've just completed the Migrant Leaders Development Programme and offered a position on a, a very good graduate scheme. So it's definitely not all been plain sailing. To begin with, I didn't get the A-level results that I wanted, and I didn't get into any of the universities that I'd been offered places for. Um, but I knew that the goal for me was still to go to university, and I was determined to attain that degree. So this was also against what my parents wanted. Being the first to go to university um, in my family, it was definitely against the norm or the unwritten family rules that were definitely in the back of my mind as an influence. So despite this, and despite my results, again, I was determined to bounce back. 
and prove that I was capable of, of completing a good degree. So I found myself applying for degree apprenticeships and I was rejected many, many times. Um, but I persevered and I was offered a spot, like I said, for a full-time business degree starting in January in London. And without, without that drive to, to con continue to persevere and realising that was one of my key strengths, I definitely wouldn't have been able to push myself um, towards that, that important goal. So then that following March, I discovered Ellen and Migrant Leaders, and that opened up a world of opportunities for me. So the social capital that Migrant Leaders offers, along with rapport building, um, as one of my key strengths. It meant that it was actually energizable and really enjoyable to network. And I was able to discover and find many new op uh, opportunities, discover industries that I didn't even realize existed, um, which is exactly what the, the development program is about. Um, it created so many opportunities for me and also provided the support and mentorship to believe in my own abilities and realize my strengths and succeed. So without that, I would not be anywhere near I am to where I am today. Um, to, to be fortunate enough to complete the group program, realize that I, my strengths are being driven, I'm competitive, uh, I'm a connector of people, and the program and also the, the strengths test really brought that to life and made me realize that what you think that you're actually doing naturally is actually, like Anne said, one of your superpowers. Um, and it's really important to realize that it's not just what you think is the norm, but it really is one of your superpowers. And that's what makes you unique. And, and that's what makes everyone different. And it's brilliant that these sort of networks that are occurring, that we do have, fortunately, brings them all, all those strengths together and everyone can bounce, bounce off each other. So thank you for, for listening to my story. And that was a little, into, in my, little insight into into where I've where I've come from and, and where I am now. So thank you. Thanks ever so much for that, James. We really appreciate it. And it does really help to start to bring the strength to life. And once you recognise what you have, um, you can start to, to, to put them to good use. So we're going to come back and we'll spend a little bit more time later on with Trudy unpacking those in more detail. But it's great to have that example. So many thanks for sharing. And then my final slide for this session is to leave you with a quote. Strengths do not come from winning. Your struggles develop your strengths. When you go through hardships and decide not to surrender, that is strength. So I'll leave you with that thought for now. And I very much look forward to resuming the conversation a little bit later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, fantastic. And um, you picked on one of my heroes, Arnold, because I think anyone who can excel at three separate careers in their lifetime uh, is someone to be admired and uh, clearly he's very strong and resilient so thank you thank you for that and I think that um, I saw uh, Giovanni uh, join um, I'd like to introduce Giovanni as one of um, one of the early mentors that I recruited for migrant leaders and until recently Giovanni was a production leader at Rolls-Royce and he has um, uh, recently joined Amazon as an area manager and he's one of our extraordinary engineering uh, mentors and uh, I will no doubt will go on to have an incredibly illustrious career if he already doesn't have it. And so Giovanni would like to share his career story with uh, everyone. And uh, I am delighted to welcome uh, Giovanni Sobrero. Thank you, Alan. I hope uh, that everyone is having a good evening. Apologies if I join a couple of minutes later. Just had to quickly finish work today. So yes, uh, I'm going to um, join. I'm going to describe uh, my career history so far. And uh, I hope that will uh, inspire uh, um, some of you guys to um, really pursue what um, your passion is. And um, from what I heard so far, there's been a lot of you know good advices. And I'm gone. Ooh, I'm gone a second. Sorry, I have to switch the light back on. So. Um, Apologies for that. So there's been a lot of good advices and uh, what I would really uh, want um, to say before I actually start uh, presenting my career story is that your academic degree or your background, social background or ethnicity background, uh, 
or cultural background in general doesn't define you at all. You define yourself uh, by uh, the power of your passions and uh, um, your drive uh, to succeed in what you really believe in. So I'm gonna um, share my screen now. I hope you should be able to see my uh, presentation. All right, so everyone should be able to see my uh, presentation. So good evening, everyone. My name is um, Giovanni Sobrero. I'm uh, from Italy. I've just turned uh, 27 recently and I'm a mentor at the wonderful uh, Migrant Leader Organization. So my, um, my story starts uh, in Italy, where my academic background started. I uh, finished high school and joined university for a bachelor degree in uh, mechanical engineering. And um, straight after, I decided to move uh, to Leeds in the UK, which was a city that was really close to my heart, uh, and do uh, and pursue a master in uh, mechatronics and uh, robotics uh, engineering. Um, I was really passionate about robotics and mechatronics. Uh, and so after my uh, master degree, I um, was fortunate enough to be offered a place at one of the best British company in history, which is uh, um, Rolls Royce in their control system division. Now, I think this is a really good point uh, in my timeline to actually say that I was really passionate about robotics, mechatronics, machine learning, and automotion. And so I decided to join the control system department for Rolls-Royce, which uh, is very much involved uh, with uh, the um, development uh, of the control fuel system and, and electronic control system for the aircraft engines that Rolls-Royce uh, produces. So I joined Rolls-Royce uh, and uh, I did my graduate scheme, which was uh, between around 16, 18 months. Uh, and uh, I moved around different departments. Uh, and uh, again, I suggest to everyone that is about to leave university in, uh, in this conference to really look for graduate scheme because uh, I found myself very hard to know exactly what you want to do in your life straight after university when you are 22, 23, or 24. So a graduate scheme in any company will give you the opportunity to move around different departments and really experience different uh, uh, career opportunities. And then they will hopefully give you the choice to choose which one it's closer to your strength and you know to your superpower so you can pursue as a proper career so um i moved around and i did a lot of uh, to start with system engineering because I, I was really really passionate you know about uh, matlab and uh, simulink and a lot of programming and machine learning and system engineering provided me the opportunity to work uh, in a, a very dynamic environment because I was working on military projects using uh, uh, a lot of MATLAB and Simulink to simulate uh, certain engine conditions, which were really, really interesting. And I also had the ability, I also had the opportunity to actually see an engine to be fired up. So it was a really, really good opportunity. And then I decided to uh, still stay technical, so close to my engineering background and do something different. So I decided to spend uh, four months uh, in manufacturing engineering as a, a manufacturing engineer. So I was overlooking the uh, technical drawing release uh, for uh, new components uh, in the engines that we were making or uh, to overlook uh, concession for parts that were not functioning as uh, they were designed to, and uh, you know, do a lot of problem solving, a root cause analysis to understand what were wrong and be proactive and put in the long-term fix. Um, and at the same time, making sure that the current parts that were going on engine that were flying people, so 300 lives every time, were uh, fit for function and uh, we can all fly safely. So after we spent around 10 months uh, between system engineering and manufacturing engineering, I decided to do a mini attachment in uh, something that I never experienced before first hand, uh, and uh, uh, especially as a professional career, which was uh, project management. So although this was outside my engineering um, 
sphere, it was very much related to a technical background. So I was still project managing engineering projects. So having this good deal uh, and knowledge of uh, technical engineering and sound technical background analytical skills really helped me stand like being something different uh, in the pool of project managers that Rolls Royce had. And uh, because this was a, a very important moment, because I think it was uh, around 13, 14 months in the graduate scheme and I had to start making a choice, I decided that pure engineering because wasn't really for me due to my strength and skills. So I'm a very outgoing person, very social person that I like, you know, getting involved uh, with um, everyone and uh, I really um, getting the end dirty in a way. Um, wasn't uh, uh, being in front of a screen for eight, 10 hours a day doing a lot of uh, uh, analytical calculations uh, and waiting for results wasn't really for me. So I wanted something more dynamic. And at the same time, my experience in project management um, gave me a new window of opportunity, which because I really enjoy managing projects and um, being the point of contact uh, for uh, projects where the budget was uh, half a million pounds, like it's a big responsibility. So I decided to join the operations, which I thought was the perfect mix between um, engineering, manufacturing and project management. And uh, because of that, I did the three months uh, in operations and then uh, I kept it as uh, what well, it was my first proper job into Rolls-Royce after my graduate scheme. And I was uh, a manufacturing project leader um, for the aftermarket department. Now, as a manufacturing project leader, when I first took it on, I didn't really know what actually was involved there until I was two, three months into the role. And at that point, I understood that it meant everything so as a manufacturing project lead for the aftermarket, I was involved with uh, all the legacy product that Rolls-Royce made. So some of you might know the famous Trend 700, which is what made uh, Rolls-Royce really famous, or the RB211, which on the other hand is almost the engine that cracked the company back in the 90s. And I was involved with um, basically reintroducing replacement parts uh, for all these overall and legacy engines that Rolls-Royce never made. And because I was leading the project from scratches to reintroduce components for these very um, old engines, I was involved with everything from start to finish. I was managing the project. I was the technical subject matter expert based on my experience in manufacturing engineering and uh, background in a, uh, as a, an engineer. And uh, I was also responsible for the delivery. And so I was the face for, with the customer. So it was literally the full life cycle of a component from the block of metal that you can imagine up to delivery with the customer to make sure that the component gets delivered on time, on spec and on budget for the customer. Um, so it was really tough. Um, assignment i would say it was a i was fighting almost a lost battle because you can imagine as rolls royce prioritizes new engines over uh, legacy components so having to try and get a space for manufacturing legacy components uh, on a new production line it was something really challenging and i really had to appeal to all my strengths and super power of being a people person of uh, always try to look for a win-win situation and uh, compromise uh, uh, with uh, other uh, project leads. So I decided that this was uh, really interesting. It taught me a lot, but I didn't have the direct control of people, uh, which is what uh, production for components really is. So I decided to become a manager at that point and be a production leader where I could really manage myself 
of uh, technicians, of skilled technicians that could actually execute uh, according to my schedule. And um, I was basically on the other side of the fence for 12 months as a manager. So I had a lot of project leads coming to me, asking for their requirement. And uh, when they could uh, get those parts delivered and I was supposed to execute the operations, uh, the production planning and everything uh, for all the different components. And it was great because he was giving me a overview on all the projects that Rolls Royce was doing, old projects, new projects, um, the new development project, um, military, civil, literally everything. And it was really, really good. Uh, after 12 months, I have um, um, an opportunity presented for me to leave the company and move to uh, what will be my next professional step, which is uh, uh, Amazon. So I joined Amazon in February 2021. So it's just been really um, three months last Saturday. And um, I have joined as a narrow manager to in uh, operation. So this is my official business title. What it means is that I am a subject matter expert for the Amazon operation delivery system in one of the two main departments of Amazon. So Amazon is divided especially in two departments, inbound, which receives all the product from different carriers, and outbound, which satisfies customer order. So I work for inbound, and as you can see here, I'm responsible for the inventory management for to make sure that um, the uh, fulfillment of uh, customer order happens on time, on spec, and on budget. And I'm not sure if you ever have ever ordered anything on Amazon, but you get it crazy fast. And uh, I really saw why you get it crazy fast because this works. This place works uh, at another another speed, uh, another pace. Uh, it's just uh, unbelievable. I'm really, uh, I'm still getting my head around. Uh, uh, I've literally finished working 20 minutes ago. It's just like, it's crazy, but it's really, really good because then uh, you have uh, a, a great satisfaction in actually achieving a lot of volumes every day. So to give you an idea, my uh, average daily volume to be processed as an area manager to bring parcel in and making sure they are ready to uh, be picked by outbound and delivered to the customer is around 30,000 units. So that is absolutely incredible. So in Amazon, uh, I don't really have um, um, a technical role. I'm more in charge of a bigger team. So I've got 120 associates working for me that need to uh, deliver, um, need to make sure and process the parcels to make sure that they get delivered to the customer on time. But I am more on the managerial side. And uh, this being said, what I want to mention is that having a technical background and a technical engineering background is such a competitive advantage. So Amazon, you if you do a bit of research, is a, a data-driven company. Like whatever decision you're gonna make, whatever explanation you have to give, whatever proposal you want to do for a new project, it needs to be backed by solid data. The data are available, they are everywhere. But being able to crunch this data twice as fast as all the other managers because of a technical background and having a solid mathematical and analytical skills that really helps crunching those data and also making sense in those data much faster than the other managers is a competitive advantage. I'm really seeing the benefits for it. And although I'm not classified as an engineer anymore and um, I've done my academic background in engineering. I will, I'm so grateful for it. Um, and uh, I've done my experience as an engineer, I would say, and you'll see in the next slide. But um, what I want to say at this point in my uh, career timeline is uh, to basically um, jump on the back of what I said at the beginning. So your academic background and your um, social and cultural background doesn't define you at all. If you're passionate about uh, operations and you know managing people, having a technical background and engineering background doesn't stop you. And um, on the other hand, if you're really passionate about uh, being a um, subject matter expert engineer, that doesn't stop you being a manager if that is something you want to. So I've seen a lot of managers in Rolls Royce being very good engineers.
okay so it works both ways and it doesn't define you so my suggestion is really work for your passion and uh, have the drive to fulfill and satisfy everything that um, you are passionate about so then in this slide i've just got a quick professional highlights so um, i hope uh, this will inspire people to actually um, go for uh, these awards because uh, some of them are awards or uh, to find a mentor that can help you achieving these awards and also i hope this will help people um, realizing what's out there available so i won the bright spark award in march 2019 because uh, of the work that I did in system engineering actually with uh, the military team and the bright spark was uh, sponsored by the uh, rs components uh, and the it which is actually my professional institution as an engineer because i cannot neglect the fact that my tech, my academic background is engineering so i was born as an engineer and then i managed to get lean six sigma certified as a green belt in july 2019 and this is something that i believe all the engineers should uh, um, pursue and uh, it's a great addition to your analytical skills and background because a, a Six Sigma certification really uh, gives you that set of tools to um, run continuous improvement projects and lean projects. And there is a lot of data analysis, believe it or not. You use like Minitab as a software, which is an analytical software um, for analyzing big, massive databases of data. So I really hope that people that have got um, the passion about engineering and continuous improvement at the same time really go for uh, the green belt. So while I was a manufacturing project leader, I also got my qualification in project manager. So uh, I'm a professionally uh, qualified project manager and an engineer at the same time. So is uh, really my suggestion is for everyone here is to never limit uh, your um, set of skills, anything that you are passionate and think can complement one of your strengths or superpower, I believe you should go for it. And uh, always be curious and always be passionate uh, um, about uh, what is outside of your comfort zone, because that's where uh, you really stretch yourself and grow as a professional and as a person. Um, then because of my work as a manufacturing project leader was the winning of the rising star award in december 2019 and uh, finally uh, one year later in uh, november 2020 i achieved what is probably the biggest milestone of my career so far i became a chartered engineer and that was great uh, because uh, it really meant uh, recognition for my uh, academic background and my work experience up to that point. And when I became a chartered engineer, I realized right now it's time to move and uh, combine all my technical skills and all my people skills in something um, better or bigger. And Amazon is much, much bigger than everything that I ever thought. So this kind of concludes my presentation. It is very simple and uh, is very um, uh, very lean in a way. There's no much information. There's uh, just an introduction about my career history. And uh, I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope it inspired you um, in different ways. And uh, what I would like to have it is like a Q and A session because uh, I always think that talking about myself is great, but I'm doing this to you know help people and uh, inspire people. So if we've got a bit of time, and maybe have a quick Q and A session could help. Thank you, thank you so much, Giovanni. This was an inspirational story, and I thought I knew pretty much everything about your wonderful career story, but uh, <laughs> I I really enjoyed hearing your full story Giovanni congratulations on the leading and exemplary engineering career that you've had and um, I should really share also that tonight um, we also have uh, a number of our um, engineering mentors uh, from uh, either engineering careers or engineering companies we've got Jordan from here from BAE Systems we've got Jamie from Siena we've got Charlotte from AME We've got Alan and Joe here from Smith & Nephew. We've got Diego Henriquez from Anglo-American. These are all uh, operational and engineering companies. 
And um, if any of our mentees, uh, perhaps um, Day or Canav, as um, as uh, aerospace engineering and mechanical engineering students um, and others, um, other mentees, if you have any questions for any of our um, mentors, please feel free to ask now. Uh, hello. May I ask my question first, if that's all right? Hello, Ka hello, Canav. Hi, Alham. Thank you for that. I uh, just want to quickly say, Giovanni, that was very insightful. I actually resonated with a few a uh, few sentences you said about, you know, the whole, you know, because the, there's, there's a stereotype with the engineering mind, like where we like to sit on desks and just do calculations. I personally don't think that's the case for myself. Uh, I'm currently a second year at University of Manchester doing aerospace engineering, and I'm also working with migrant leaders as a student engagement intern. And uh, I wanted to um, kind of find out if, you know how you said you're now working at Amazon? Do you know what sort of like educational background people around you have? Because personally, I don't know if I'll end up in an engineering like, uh, for example, Rolls Royce or BA Systems, or if I'll end up somewhere else. I just want to know, like, what kind of people do you work alongside on a day to day? Um, that is a great question because uh, you wouldn't believe the educational background that I've got around me. And uh, it's more like not even the educational background that I've got around me, it's more the roles that those people actually have. So to give you an idea, um, what I think my career developing in Amazon is going to be, I think my next role will be a process engineer in Amazon. So I'm currently uh, proxying, which is basically um, stepping up uh, and supporting a process engineer. Oh, hang on a second, I hate this. Uh, that time, there's nothing I can do. So um, I'm proxying for a um, process engineer and um, he comes from, he's a, um, academic background is actually geography and uh, before working as a um, as a process engineer in Amazon he worked uh, as an um, operational manager at uh, IKEA so he has a lot of uh, you know experience uh, in um, retail company which is what Amazon uh, fulfillment center are about but he's leading engineering projects, and I've seen the project he's leading for uh, half a million pounds to automating the process that is um, used to unload the very big containers. So if you imagine like a container filled with um, TVs, mm. the amount of boxes, like the, the size of those boxes and the weight of those boxes are, uh, are very large and you're easily talking more than 15 kilos per box, which is a, a very physical activity. So the way what he's looking at is introducing this robotic, so automated um, system that automatically picks the boxes instead of having a person picking the boxes and then putting them on a conveyor and so on. He's looking at introducing a robotic car basically that automatically picks the boxes up and puts them on the conveyor and then the associates down the line process the box so again your academic background doesn't um doesn't define you doesn't limit you he comes from you know geography ikea and is leading this project to introduce um, automated and robotic arm and the reason is because he's very good with uh, data is uh, he's got He's got a very analytical mind and you know he's very calculated in everything he does but this is exactly what i was saying before having this this academic background is a big competitive advantage because i feel because of my academic background uh, i could be a great process engineer uh, because i Yes, he's very good with data, but I feel like I'm crunching data twice as fast as he does, and I really understand it. And uh, I also, having studied robotics and mechatronics, I had um, a lot of interaction with actually robotics arm company. So funnily enough, this is a project that is, seems to be tailor-made on me, and uh, is a half a million pounds project. So it's not a project uh, that um, doesn't have any visibility inside the company. So um, I believe that my next role, I, I would love my, for my next role to be a process engineer. So I'll probably leave management again and I'll go back uh, uh, crunching data. But this, uh, 
is exactly what I was trying to say before. I suggest everyone to actually do a graduate scheme because you've got engineers like software engineers who spend a lot of time in front of a computer, but operations engineers, they live and breathe on the shop floor. They interact with associates. So you've got their people uh, side of, uh, of the business uh, and yet you're still doing engineering things and technical and automotion and you know future looking things so this is i uh, hope this answers your question um basically yeah. i don't i'm not going to go in all these all the people that i've got around me uh the work in any background but this is uh, to give you um, an idea that i've got people coming from engineering there's people coming from management people coming from geography philosophy uh, to um, get back on what Anne was saying before if kids you know want to do philosophy that doesn't necessarily mean they cannot work uh, uh, on engineering projects uh, or uh, engineering um, uh, companies or different roles there's mm. different type of engineers really and that's what i believe really needs to be clear to everyone like operational engineers uh, whether you're working in a manufacturing company such as Rolls Royce, BA, Eaton, and you are living and breathing the manufacturing process, the manufacturing line with block of metals, or you're working for companies such as Amazon, IKEA, where it's more retail, and um, you've got uh, your engineering is automotion engineering, so improvement, uh, uh, robotics engineering, all of this. Uh, um, it's a different type of engineering, but it's always engineering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Kenav, and, um, and thank you, Giovanni. Um, Giovanni, another question has come up from one of our other mentees, Ali, who has asked, um, what do firms such as Rolls-Royce and Amazon focus on when deciding uh, whether to employ you or not? For example, do they focus on your A-levels, your GCSEs, your experience, or just your degree? This is a great question. And uh, the answer is almost none of them. So um, from what I learned in my experience going through different interviews, um, at Rolls-Royce, when you join the graduate scheme, provided that you pass the online test, that as soon as you, so the way it works for graduate scheme, for, who doesn't, for people who don't know that, is that you apply with your CV and cover letter. You get automatically sent a test. Uh, which is an online test that usually is a logical, um, logical, reasonable, and behavioral test, uh, which tests different skills, tests logical skills, tests people skills, emotional intelligence skills, and so on. And um, if you pass that test, you're normally invited to a phone interview or an assessment center. And at that point, uh, at the assessment center, for Rolls Royce specifically, in my, in my experience, is um, almost it doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter what your um, academic degree is. If you're there, it's because they think you have something to add to the company and they are looking for team players. When you, when you join uh, big corporations, you've got to think that you need to be a team player. You can be the best engineer in the world, but if you're not able to work in a team and to play along other people's strengths and just focusing on yours. That is not what company wants because the uh, success of the overall company is much greater than the success of one single individual. So is be a team player, making sure um, that you've got emotional intelligence so you know when to speak and when not to, and uh, also making sure that you are interested in learning from other people because you'll see that when you actually join your first company, um, you probably realize that you don't know much about it, uh, you, about your job. You think you knew everything from um, university, but then you realize that it's totally different and you've got stuff from scratch, it's really. Um, I think uh, um, this is the main thing the company is looking for, really, people that are willing to go above and beyond what's required, they're always curious uh, to learn new things and to be team players. 
Thank you so much, Giovanni. And if I may uh, invite um, Alan Hunt and Joe Barrett um, as you're representing Smith & Nephew as another STEM employer, I wonder if Alan or Joe from Smith & Nephew would like to add um, anything in terms of what are some of the qualities and capabilities that a Smith & Nephew look for uh, when they are hiring um, young, diverse talent? Um, one, of the, one of the key things that we'd um we do do and it, it, it this is a a very standard piece for our um for our graduate schemes and for in fact for all the way up and down is um the group activities so getting a putting a case study effectively where there is no right answer um there's a stack of ethics ethical choices there's a stack of other pieces and we and i'm aware this comes across as quite unfair but we actually put the deep run a sort of semi-competitive piece between all of the oh, sorry a competitive piece between all of the applicants to see to come to an answer and the um actually the the way that people um work with others the way that people interact the way that you get across your decisions or and influences is actually something that we particularly look for um not necessarily this is not the thing where the loudest person wins the person who stands up and says, I'm going to go organise this, is almost certainly the person you don't want. Um, the person who just goes and puts through, quietly puts through the pieces that they're actually looking for and knows how to play, play the field, play the, the rest effectively, is usually the, the, the way that we, we go at it. Um, I'm obviously an engineering uh, I'm director of engineering for research and development. So we do a lot of pieces in uh, innovation. We get, we give people case studies of some, something that, um, something that we're not doing, but because, uh, but something that is extraordinarily close to something that we're doing and get you to play. Um, it's absolutely, we want to, we don't need necessarily the right answer. What we absolutely want is to see people from, <laughs> diverse thought processes jumping off and going and see the wheels turning and understand how you're how you're behaving how you think thank you, thank you. Thank so, you so much just going to add to that so um so i'm not an engineer by trade or any way shape or form um obviously i do work for a med tech company but as a medical writer so when we're interviewing people we have we don't have gadgets and stuff to play with and have this kind of competition, but we do look for team spirit and look how people fit within the company and how people draw on experiences. Um, you know, the talking earlier about playing cricket, you know, something like that where you are working as a team is really important for us and how people have overcome challenges. It's not about getting the best grade first time round. It's what you've done to overcome those challenges and address those in your life. So those are things that we look for as well. Thank you so much, Joe and Alan from Smith & Nephew. And I think we've got Jamie from Siena, another um, STEM employer. Um, and I wonder if, Jamie, um, you'd like to add anything in terms of um, how Siena recruits young talent and what are some of the capabilities and qualities that Siena would like to see in their new recruits? Thank you. Um, I mean, from my perspective, I think cultural fit is one of the uh, the biggest factors. And I don't mean cultural in terms of your background, but just your ability to fit into the business and where you interact with people, the energy that you bring to the opportunity. So again, you don't have to be totally aligned from a qualification standpoint. Obviously, we do have engineering tracks in our business, which require you to have an engineering and mathematical background. But to me, really, it's around the cultural fit and the energy you bring to an interview and engagement with with people you interact in the process, it's going to take you a long way in uh, in selecting it. And to me, I don't have an in, in, uh, a degree, but uh, when I look at people with degree, that just tells me they're able to commit themselves to something and complete it. Um, and if they can do that, it's a great uh, reference point to start with. So. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jamie. And um, I wonder if any of our other mentors would like to add anything to um, the kind of qualities and capabilities that they themselves and their companies look for when they're recruiting young talent. I, I don't know whether we have Diego yet here from Anglo-American 
not not yet. That's right. Francis was just waving. Is someone waving? Sorry. Hey, Francis is waving. I am indeed. Hey, um, uh, Frank, uh, nice to uh, nice to see you. I know Frank and I worked in EY together. And uh, Frank, I'll let you introduce yourself uh, in the context of SAP and your role. Yes. Um, just before I do that, I, I, I have been following the conversations and they seem to be heavily skewed towards um, engineering. And I'm going to follow that, but also break it. So many, many years ago, um, I studied chemical engineering at the University of Leeds. So there was a reference to Leeds earlier on. And um, like most people, I went into engineering and I was an R&D engineer for a number of years. And I decided it wasn't for me. And I moved into manufacturing and general supply chain. And over the years, I've specialized in procurement and supply chain. So why am I saying all this? Because um, where you start doesn't necessarily mean that's where you're going to end. So if you, if you have skills in science or arts or any other particular area, uh, do not feel that's something you have to do for the next 40 years. Um, uh, we all have different skills and when we get into um, normal ways of working, what you find, and hopefully you're picking this up because it has been mentioned a few times, it's some of the softer skills that help you in terms of progressing your career. Empathy, listening, project management skills, change management skills, um, being prepared to take accountability and ownership, working on your own in terms of being able to drive initiatives, but also being a team player. Easier said than done, but that is what career development is all about. It's all about developing those skills. And that can take you in any direction you see fit. So for the past eight years, I've been working for a technology company, far removed from chemical engineering. And my role is to work with customers to understand the value that technology can bring in solving their business issues. Again, far removed from my days of fluid mechanics and thermodynamics uh, and chemical engineering. So my message to everybody is, um, yeah, fine, your discipline may define the first few years of your career in terms of um, what employers may be looking for in terms of your technical skills, but it doesn't need to define the rest of your story. Uh, and to progress, it's about the softer skills, which we've all been talking about this, this evening. So, for example, uh, I mean, my superpower, if you want to call it that, is my ability to connect with people, build empathy and trust. Uh, and that enables me to uh, listen, understand what their challenges are and their business issues, and then coming up with the right type of solutions that will drive the improvements they're looking for. You can't do that unless you listen. You can't do that unless you build empathy and trust. So that's what I would say. And yeah, I'm enjoying my time at SAP. And whenever we run assessment centers for interns, that's essentially what they're looking for in group discussion. So somebody mentioned it before, it's not the loudest person. It's not the person who steals an idea from somebody else and shouts, hey, I've got this idea, when really it was somebody next to them. It's about taking an idea, developing it, and taking people along with you. And also, if somebody else has another idea, that is okay. Think about how you can build on that idea and refine it. Uh, and that is really what a lot of employers uh, like SAP are looking for. Thank you so much, Frank. And I know that um, a question came up um, that was about later on in one's professional career. How um, do our mentors balance family and a full-time job and at the same time, additional extracurricular activities and qualifications um, and achievements. How do, you, how do you balance that? Ellen, I'd be happy to help with that if you'd like me to tell Thank you. Story. Thank you, Rupa. We would be honoured uh, if you tell us your story. Right. So um, 
my name is Rupa Kotacha. I'm not going to go on camera because my son keeps walking in and out of the room and he'll probably start waving to you. So I'm going to not allow that to happen. She'll get very distracted. But anyway, my name is Rupa Kotacha. I am um, like Ellen. I trained as an accountant thinking that I, you know, wanted to be an accountant for the rest of my life. And I wanted to do month end forever and ever. And um Within about two years, I realised that actually that was really not what I wanted to do. Um, but what was interesting about my story was that I did, um, I also do SAP. So I'm an SAP consultant. I moved from training as an accountant to becoming an SAP trainer. And um, so I'll, I'll share my age with you. I'm 46. So I've been working over 20 years now. And um, I started training um, as an accountant I, at 23 or at 22, 23 or 24, I decided that this really wasn't for me. And so I started um, working as an SAP trainer and then moved very, very quickly into the technical area. The thing is, I hadn't finished my accountancy training. And because my job took me traveling around the world, um, and I spent a lot of time away from home. I found it really, really tough to finish my exams. And they got married at around 37. Um, some of this group know me quite well, so they will remember that. And um, at um, just before I turned 40, found myself on my own with a 16-month-old child. Um, how do I balance it? I absolutely love what I do. I have a real passion for it. I'm also doing migrant leaders. I do some other extracurricular activities. And I've got a seven-year-old. Um, I've been on my own since he was 16 months. I have an amazing support network around me. I think um, one of my key strengths is resilience. So I just keep going. Um, but whilst I was on this journey in between, I carried on doing my accountancy training and people were saying to me, well, what are you doing? You know, you've got a great job, um, you're earning really good money. What, why are you still doing your exams? And I said, um, because I started them and I have to finish them um, and I, I can't not finish them. And, and I think my learning certainly was and, and I, I tell you that I finished my last two exams after I found myself on my own with a 16 month old child. So I did my last two exams when when I had a baby, a full time job um, and I was on my own. Um, but looking back, it was the best thing I ever did because actually I was climbing the career ladder um, very, very quickly. Um, and it plateaued a bit um, when I found myself by myself. But the other thing was that making sure that I could fall back on my education, so my accountancy training, when I went out to sort of look for a job that was sort of palatable to, to being a single working mother, um, the training that I had completed just put me one step ahead of the other people around me. Um, it hasn't been easy. Um, I think having an absolutely great network has helped. Um, being a real team player has helped. Um, I build rapport fairly quickly. Um, I give feedback, but I also accept constructive feedback. Um, I'm fairly empathetic. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to be told when I'm wrong and learn from it. Um, there are one or two people that know me on this call that would probably disagree with that, but never mind. Um, and um, and I think um, also, um, you know, I, I have a huge passion for what I do. And I think if there's one piece of advice I would give people on my journey anyway, and, and sort of why I've managed to balance what I'm doing um, is A, because I, I really am so passionate by what I do. And the other thing is, is, is I've always had my education to fall back on and my network. And um, I think that's allowed me to do something I really, really love, but in an, you know, but still be a mum and I suppose a single mum at that. Um, it's not easy, um, but um, because I just love what I do, it makes it so much easier. 
So I don't know if that answers the question to whoever asked the, asked the question. Well, Rupa, that was fantastic because you gave insight into what real careers look like and what it feels like to balance um, very important aspects of ourselves and our lives. And one of the challenges for diverse talent, uh, for young talent uh, from underrepresented backgrounds is that they do their research and they see the company websites, they see the bios of people's careers, and it all looks perfect and it all looks really planned. Uh, nobody talks about the challenges, the failures, uh, the juggling that they have to do to get there. Um, so it's really useful um, to um, young people to hear stories of real careers. Um, Can I, I um, sorry. Um, hi, sorry. Um, uh, hi, Lynn. Um, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. I wasn't sure who else was speaking. Sorry, I interrupted you. Um, but I just thought I would take the opportunity to quickly introduce myself. And then uh, I'm really very delighted to be invited uh, to be uh, part of the discussion. So my name is Lynn, and then um, I work for Goldman Sachs, uh, a financial service firm. And then I joined as an analyst, uh, and that was 10 years ago. So 10 years later, um, that uh, I am still, um, I guess, one of the only Chinese professional in this um, kind of capacity so partially that drives um you know my thinking on diversity but i love the, the question that was raised about parenting um and then about you know this uh, work-life balance so i really just want to comment on that because um um, a lot of people um, think that when they start out on being a parent, you know, they were thinking, oh, I'm going to have to do all of that at once. So when we think of a balance, it comes down to what they implied a zero sum mindset. That means, you know, to be better at work, I have to be worse as a parent or worse, give up something in my community life or sleep less. So when you think win and lose, then somebody is going to lose. So I think what I've found is really, you know, to bring the parenting to be more parallel with what I do. And then uh, to give you an example, right, um, I mentioned diversity. This is really part of how I have crafted my role to really help me find a sense of purpose, you know, so that I'm no longer the only Chinese person in my current role or the current industry. But um, but sometimes that this diversity goes way beyond what it seems, you know, like a political debate or like a business discussion. Because um, um, some of you know that I'm actually on a maternity leave at the moment for my second child and my first child is three um you know when there are two or three like all parents around the world I just felt really out of depth um from time to time understanding their behavior so uh, you know I turned to what I know um you know alongside complaining with other parents by the way you know I, I turned to some things I normally do when I need knowledge you know I read a lot of books I listened to a lot of talks so I think I after the 20th book I read, I started to see some common themes from this. You know, that is for a child to thrive. Empathy um, is ultimately the most important element because you have to understand their perspectives before that you can influence them. And also you need to create this environment that he feels safe, an environment he feels um, belong. So uh, that's when, you know, when they're not afraid and not worried, they can have the energy to explore the world um, as they should be. But I was like, hang on a second, isn't this exactly the same thing I talk about work uh, in relation to diversity, you know, about this psychological safety, about this belonging. So when we don't question whether we belong to a workplace, that's when we can be most effective, most productive, and the most ourselves. So I guess, you know, if we can understand this three-year-old, be empathetic to their view, we can definitely, you know, be much more uh, in tune of the bigger challenge that is not um, defined by their difference be it race or gender so I think this is how I really learned that being a parent is to be holistic um, so I bring my holistic self to work uh, but also I bring work to home which is you know, have to think like a leader when you try to discipline your children explain the why not just do as I told you which is not different to when you want to influence at work as well so no more divisions the more that holistic we can bring ourselves the more you know we can kind of um, divide some of the barriers to be our differences and then and I think that's where we can be more effective and no longer see this zero-sum game. 
Lynn, that was wonderful. And I really liked the points that you made, particularly because a lot of young people, when they sit down, for example, to write down their CVs or apply to certain companies and roles or to describe their strengths and achievements, they only think of their education and work experience. What they don't sometimes realize is that a lot of their strengths and skills and leadership comes from all of their life including what, how they've helped their families, how they've helped their siblings, how they've supported their, uh, their local communities. So I would say to young people, look for your strengths in all areas of your life because you're the same person uh, when it comes to your education, your work, your family, your communities, your personal life, your parenting. Um, you're the same person. Find your strengths in all those areas because they're common denominators. So Lynn, very good to see you and uh, thank you for that. Um, that was very well said, by the way. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's, it's very easy to summarize, isn't it? <laughs> so thank you so much, Lynn. And um, um, this is a great discussion, and without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Trudy Bateman. Um, I am personally very grateful to Trudy um, and Anne Wilson, who have supported our Migrant Leaders Partnership with the company Capfinity. So through the partnership, we are bringing the uh, strengths profile assessments to all our mentors and mentees. And I know discussing the strengths profile assessment with a couple of my own direct mentees, it's already proving to be incredibly helpful to uh, young people finding their strengths and natural capabilities really early on in their lives and in their careers so that they don't have to do some of the trial and error that me and some others may have had to do to get to what they really love and feel passionate about. Um, before before uh, I bring uh, Trudy into the, to, to do her talk, I did promise uh, Piali Mitra um, that, that she was going to introduce herself. Apologies, I, I forgot. No, no worries at all. And I'll, I'll keep it Welcome. quick. I just, I just wanted to, you know, extend uh, my, you know, it's, it's great to be, be here. And the one topic I wanted to pick very quickly was about this work-life balance. So a quick uh, background about myself, uh, like Lynn and like many others, I think on this call, I'm from the finance industry and I'm a chartered accountant. I've got circa 20 years of uh, uh, work experience across a whole host of banks. Now, very interestingly, I've, I've, my son is nine years old, uh, and I think I, I did get my, the maximum career growth once I had a child. So I think some of this is a mindset where you think that, oh, because you're starting a family or because you're, you know, now you've got additional priorities, you're, something has to give. But I, and, and, and absolutely, as, as Lynn, I think, nicely put it, which is a zero net sum game, something has to give, but it's not always your family. And I, I view this more as a work, work life flow rather than balance. And what that means is on some days, uh, my work trumps my family. And on some other days, depending on the circumstances of someone's ill or I need to care for someone or I have a school activity to go to, then the family trumps the work. But overall, it nets out. Uh, at the end of the day, what I truly believe has helped me is be really clear about what people can expect from you and when. So, you know, I'm, I'd always give anything I do my 100%. So people know that when I'm at work, I'm giving it my 100%. When I'm at home, I'm giving it my 100%. And the, the, the rest, they've just got to accept that, you know, if I've committed to doing something, but I can't do it right now because I've got some family commitments, they do know that I will I will deliver it at the quality that, I'm, that I've got, got the reputation for. And I think managing those expectations up front uh, is key. So you wouldn't really always, um, you know, I mean, no one will just expect what's happening in your personal life. People can only see that tip of the iceberg, what you show them. So I, I would advise having the open conversation with your line managers when you're, you know, when either when you're having a, a milestone change or, uh, or, or you do get a new line manager, just to manage that through uh, is, is critical. But I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Alan. Thank you so much, Piali. And, um, and really, um, I would say to young people, you know, I see it in my own children and, uh, you know, 
11, 12 GCSEs and they are learning additional extracurricular things and they have to think about what A-levels to pick. And then later on at university, while settling in university life, they have to land internships, get graduate jobs, make contacts. There's so much so much to do. And I know Anne will have so many more stories about university students as well uh, that she faces every day. Um, but re remember at times like that, when it all feels overwhelming, I would say to young people, when it all feels overwhelming, uh, know that this is how life is supposed to be. It is supposed to feel challenging. If you don't feel challenged, then you're not doing enough. And if it feels overwhelming, there are ways and methods and techniques to uh, make things better. And, and remember Henry Ford's saying that the plane, the aeroplane flies against the wind, not because of it. And um, so know that life is supposed to sometimes feel difficult, but that through good thinking and your techniques and a good support network and mentors, um, you can get through it. And this is all good training for you for your future because that challenge will never end as you heard from our mentors, um, challenging uh, full-time careers, um, extracurricular activities, um, volunteering their time for migrant leaders and other charities, board positions, children. So that challenge never goes away and nor should it. This is life and it's worth living. So um, this is good training, the challenge that you're experiencing now, and I would say keep going. So um, I am really honored to introduce um, Trudy Bateman, who has kindly agreed to come and talk to us about the Capfinity Strengths Profile uh, Assessments. Um, Trudy, welcome. I think I need to make Trudy a co-host. Apologies that I haven't done this in advance. Brilliant, thank you. Welcome, Trudy. Super, let me just share my screen then and away we go. Super, so thank you very much for having me here this evening and uh, Anne and I are jointly going to do this session, although I think um, Anne's spotlight's taken over slightly because my session needs to be wrapped up in just a few minutes as I'm going to do the, uh, the introduction there. So, um, but thank you all for your brilliant stories because as I was listening to this this evening, I'm thinking, well, actually, you've done my job for me, really. You've all spoken about strength so passionately. You've all come sharing your stories and all the things that have made a difference to you. So really my job here today is just to walk through a couple of the more formal bits about how we define strengths. But so, you know, thank you to Anne and, and James and Giovanni for your brilliant stories already. So where do we begin then? So I guess the first thing is just to set the scene up. My, my role as Director of Strengths Profile. Some of you have already had the chance now to take Strengths Profile. Don't worry if you haven't already. Uh, you can do so following uh, the session. So that link will be available to, to all mentors and mentees. So just follow along anyway. Um, we want to make it practical. And that's where Anne's going to come in with her expertise of, of careers and application. So what is a strength then? I guess we've talked about it quite a lot this evening and you've all shared some brilliant stories, but how do we define a strength? And some of this you've already used already. So a strength needs to be something you are good at. I mean, Anne's talked about maybe it's come through a different journey, maybe a struggle, but it's still something that right now you're good at. So that makes sense. Yeah, we, we wouldn't expect anything different. And for those of you that maybe thinking about, you know, recruitment in any way, shape or form, whether it's as a graduate or, or as, a, as a mentor, you know, we typically think about performance, good performance as, as, as competency, a level you can do. But then you get to energy and energy is all about the motivation and the passion, the why you get out of bed in the morning, your stories and what makes them your story. So the energy is really, really important. It's, it's the bit that's gonna make all the, you know, it's the bit that's gonna take you from what we call sort of average to A plus. It's, it's gonna really help define those choices that you make and help you make much more conscious choices as you go through your career as well. So I'm sure most of us who are, who are my age and uh, I, you know, I, I, obviously I, I know Anne and, and, um, and Ellen have gone through their stories, but most of us wouldn't be here, I'm sure, without our stories. But maybe if we could have avoided one or two of them on the way, we might have done. 
So it's all about giving you a conscious choice now about where you take your career, whatever stage you're at. Um, and then it's about use. It's about how often you're doing it, how often you're demonstrating it as well. Um, one of the stories that I very briefly wanted to share um, is, is when you talk to, when Anne talked about sort of your family, I guess, um, your, your values in, in the family or how your rules, I guess, in the family. One thing that made me smile, because uh, one of my top strengths is legacy. So I'm all about future and making a difference. Uh, but alongside that is my counterpoint. And rightly or wrongly in my family, maybe a generation piece, you know, parenting wasn't collaborated. It wasn't a collaboration sort of joint decision, how you might do something or whether you could participate in those rules. The rules were yours as children to follow and that was that, however ridiculous they were. And for years, I always fought those rules. I was always saying, but why? They're ridiculous rules, mum, dad, you know. And then counterpoint ended up being one of my top strengths in which I play. I hold very dear now. So I'm always about thinking, you know, how do I bring a different viewpoint to others? So I think, you know, just again, that story of where you've come from, embrace it, embrace it, define it and, and learn from it and, and help to make those more of your strengths as you go forward. So we've talked about obviously performance, energy and use, and then that fits into this model. So I know some of you have your profiles and some of you don't. Absolutely fine. What, 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 what the questions in the strengths profile will do is define this model for you. So you have four quadrants. Of the 60 strengths that we measure, you'll get your realized strengths. So these are the things that you perform well in, you're energized and you're using a lot. Um, now, because of that, we want you to use them wisely. Uh, which means dialing them up and down. And that's when we come back to this sort of conscious career. How is that going to help me? How's personal responsibility going to help me? How's enabler going to help me? And Anne's going to take you through this a lot more practically um, in the session as well. So really important that we use our strengths wisely, our real life strengths, because we love it. We're doing it a lot uh, and we're really good at it. And what we don't want to do is get burned out by those over time. Which takes me nicely into our learned behaviours then. So these are the things that we perform well at but we don't find that energizing. Now for me, in my 12 years I've been doing this, is this is the light bulb moment for so many people, particularly when it comes to careers. It's so important that you get this quadrant um, and that you have that light bulb moment for yourself. So what am I saying here? Stuff you're good at, the stuff you don't enjoy. And most of us in our careers at some point, my son is 19, he's just done his first year of uni, really transformational already. The stuff he's good at, but not the stuff he enjoys. So we often just need to work that through, what that means for us in our, in our careers as well. So most of my job you know, in when I'm coaching will be to help people coach themselves out of their learned behaviors and into their realized strengths. But you've got an opportunity to really help shape those realized strengths rather than your learned behaviors, which if you haven't taken the, the tool, you'll find out. Then we look at weaknesses. We don't define weaknesses. And I work in the corporate world day in, day out. We still don't define weaknesses there either. Um, it's very much around we, we use our strengths to compensate and we use these less. So no one's beating themselves up here. If you've got weaknesses, we've all got them. And it's time to think about using your strengths instead. Now, one of the most exciting quadrants is the unrealized strengths. So this is an area of, of potential, of, of potential passion, potential performance. So think about this as an area to develop things you're good at and you're energizing, but you're not getting an opportunity to use. So this is an area that I'm sure Anne will be bringing out and thinking about how you can be doing more of the things in your unrealized strengths. So then just a couple more bits for me really before I hand on to the lovely Anne and that's the benefits of strengths for yourselves as individuals. So of course this program is very much about you as a leader uh, and how to make those, those right choices and being a great leader and how to make those career choices but it's also about you as an individual um, and what you'll get from bringing strengths to that leadership as well. So the science will tell us that we're happier, much more confident when we're using our strengths. It helps us to reduce stress and increase resilience. We've heard quite a bit on the, on the call today, haven't we, about resilience. It's a bit of a theme we've got to where we have done already because of sheer determination, persistence and resilience coming through. But by using things that you're good at and you love to do, naturally will be more resilient. We, we heard about the well-being story in that actually if you choose a career that you're good at, you know, the, the sacrifices end up being the right sacrifices. You enjoy what you do, you bring in confidence, motivation. You're much more likely to achieve your goals when you use your strengths because they're things that you enjoy and you're good at. 
Uh, you develop much quicker in the areas of your strengths as well. We've all had friends and colleagues uh, where we've gone, how did you get that? You know, how, where did they go? I'm still here on the manual on page two on YouTube. Um, and somebody just gets something straight away, often a sign of their strengths as well. And then finally, we're much more confident in our career decisions because we have that ability to be able to, to match our strengths with careers and think about how that will, will pan out as well. So they're the benefits. And just and finally here, just thinking about actually what that means beyond yourself. So um, in your team. So bearing in mind, I work again in that corporate world day in, day out is that these, you know, I'm also employed as a consultant to support teams to use their strengths. And, and for these types of areas, you know, to, to teams to communicate much better, to delegate, to be creative, to build trust, to build diversity, some great ways in which that if you go into an organization, so about 48% now, or you know, nearly 50% are run out recruiting on the basis of some form of strengths in organizations, it's likely that you'll hit strengths even you know, in those organizations that don't recruit will be in there somewhere in terms of development as well. And how they might use strengths then to make you be, help you be your best every day. So you know, all sorts of organizational benefits here in terms of retention, engagement and flow. Um, you know, onboarding, all the sorts of success that you would expect. But, you know, organisations are very wise to the fact that they want you to come to work every day being motivated and being your best self. So on that note then, Anne, the floor is all yours, my dear, and I will let you take them into the practical strengths session and I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks very much, Trudy. And I will just start to share mine again with a couple of slides. I was um, smiling actually as Trudy was talking because we both share a love of Spotlight, which is that we actually secretly really like an audience. And I could just imagine her and I over a karaoke microphone <laughs> fighting the control over the microphone, both desperate to be centre of attention. So, so there you have it. That's that's a, a strength that we that we share straight up. So thanks very much for sharing that. And um, I it's been really interesting hearing from a number of people who who are here tonight. Um, examples either of your own personal strengths or recognition of, of different aspects of strengths and things that motivate people in the workplace so that's been really good to kind of add some flesh onto the bones really of this topic. Um, what I'd like to do next is to move us on to have a, um, a practical activity and um, once again we have the wonderful James and Day who volunteered to take part in a brief um, exercise. Now, normally in the in the in the real world, we'd be doing this in a room, and we'd be having two people um, who came to the front of the room. You'd all be watching. So I'm not quite sure how this is, is is going to work, but I'm going to ask each of them in a moment to try and illustrate strengths in action by taking it in turns to spend one minute each talking about something they really love to do. And I'll time it, and I'll stop I'll stop you each when the time runs out, and then we're going to flip this around and get each of you to spend a minute talking about something you really, really dislike. And the audience's role is to spend the four minutes noticing, listening and observing what you see and what you hear from those two participants when they're talking about the things they love and the things that they dislike. So James, would you like to go first? And are you happy um, whenever you're ready? I've got the stopwatch um, at the ready to talk about something that you really, really enjoy. Yeah, so thank you, Anne. Um, so to guess to begin with, so something I'm really passionate about is football. I think it's great because you've got so much teamwork, there's camaraderie. Um, you've not only got the aspect of playing football, but watching football is great. Uh, it's really entertaining. You've got the the highs and lows of the game. You've also got the travelling aspect of football uh, with away games, so you can go to different cities all over the country experience different cultures, meet new people. You've also got the fact that it keeps you really fit and healthy. And being able to do that within a team, either with, you, with your friends, um, I think that's it's a, it's a really important um, way to keep fit. And it's, and it's really interesting when you, when you really do, um, when, you really, when you are really invested into it, it's so good for you and, and you, you need something that you just love doing. So yeah. Fabulous, pretty much bang on the minute. That's lovely. Okay, Day, would you like to um, come forward and spend a minute telling us about something you particularly like as well? Yes, and thank you for the time. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, my cooking hobbies. So um, I was hired as a chef back in 20, 
2019 November is um, so at that time I started cooking and um, I just absolutely loved the aspect of serving people good food um, no matter who they are just passing by or working offices regular customers um, being able to serve them delicious Chinese food day in day out um, really gave me joy um, and from that job I kind of Brought, brought that home and started cooking all sorts of cuisines um, in my own house. Um, so I've got a cabinet full of all different all different spices all from around the world. Um, Japanese, um, cooking a little bit Turkish, Chinese um, being my favorite, and of course Indian from my heritage. Um, and overall, these skills have helped me um, to you know just bring this hobby and develop it as much as I can. Um, and serving my friends and family um, great food now that I'm not able to uh, work as um, uh, I'm going to stop you now I'm loving hearing your story but the time's you. up but you've illustrated that really well so thank you very much for that day now we're going to swap things around and I'm going to ask James to talk for a minute about something you really dislike doing so your time is starts now so something I'd say that I really dislike doing or it's really annoys me is doing chores mm -hmm. um so typically they're very boring, uh, they can be quite unpleasant and I think I can speak for a lot of people here is that they're especially unpleasant when you're having to do them in student accommodation. <laughs> um, they make me stressed if I don't get them done. There always seems to be an endless amount of chores and they take up so much time and energy and so they're quite demotivating actually and what I'd rather be doing is, again, out with friends or doing something that's interesting or much more productive in my eyes. So, yeah, chores for me, I'm, yeah, they're not, they're not the most fulfilling of tasks. Thank you very much. You didn't even manage to stretch it out for a whole minute, which is interesting <laughs> in itself. So thank you very much. Day, it's your turn to vent now on something you dislike doing. So recently, um, as I'm asthmatic, I got a second the second shot of the vaccine and although the process was quite streamlined I don't quite enjoy going to medical establishments uh, um, uh, being uh, at a hospital or going to the dentist um, isn't the most pleasant journey one takes um, the waiting in the waiting room the a &E is um, not fun, <laughs> especially when you have a broken arm <laughs> and it's really painful. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, going to the hospital and being around doctors and nurses, syringes, um, medicine, taking medicine is also quite a difficult task for myself. Don't enjoy the smell, um, but yeah. Thank you very much. Interestingly, again, we didn't quite stretch it to the full minute, which I think is quite telling. So I'm curious to know from the audience, um, as a result of um, James and Day doing a valiant job there of talking about the things they loved and disliked, what did you observe when they were either talking about the things that they, they liked or disliked? Um, and um, my, my difficulty is that I know Day and James very well, <laughs> so I might, uh, I might be influenced by my prior knowledge of them. But if, um, if I try and um, not be biased, um, knowing what I know, uh, James uh, is quite creative in his mind, quite collaborative and team oriented. He might not quite as much enjoy process driven uh, roles, uh, which is a good job that you're going to canter. Uh, uh, and, um, and maybe the chores, it's interesting, James's point about chores, I love chores because they, they create order and structure and enable me to implement my processes efficiently. So it's amazing how different people are. Control. <laughs> yes, thank you for no, saying no, I that. Can, I can agree to that. The only chore I really enjoy doing is dishes, which is quite surprising, but... Um, yeah, well, it, it enables your cooking. It enables um, your cooking. Yeah, that's yeah. true. But it's, it's kind of a good way to just do a boring task, but clear your mind in a way. But yeah, I think I enjoy, enjoy some chores more than others. But yeah, I agree to that. Good, good to know. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in on what they what they noticed in terms of either tone or um, the way the individual approached the topic? Yeah, we've got some things in the chat here, so. 
yes, it is much easier to talk about the things that we love. We could, um, I had to stop day talking about the cooking and the passion for that because you could have talked probably quite a long time, couldn't you? Because you were so enthusiastic about it. Um, yes, and Alan says, James smiled a lot more when he's talking about the things he didn't like, was very serious about the things he did like, but I thought he was in the zone. The, the authenticity for me came through with um, in both instances. Um, but yes, it, it's interesting. Maybe maybe James felt a bit sheepish that he didn't like the chores. James, did you? I don't know. I thought I thought it was the the part of it. I thought was the 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 thing you hate. You don't need to go and make anyone else believe. The yeah. thing you love, you want to convince them. You keep you have to keep out enough things to that one of them will land someone. Yes. In an ideal world, I'm thinking in terms of the interview context, for example, if you're applying for a job that you're genuinely interested and enthusiastic about, then this should flow through and carry through in the conversation as the interview progresses, because enthusiasm is quite difficult to fake over a period of time. Um, your nonverbal expressions will probably give you away. Um, you know, you'll be smiling just that little bit too hard trying to do a convincing job, perhaps. Um, so... Yeah, I think the energy was coming through and the passion, I think, when um, both of them were talking about the things that they like. So it was just a fun exercise to get you showing strengths when they come to life, really, and to think about, as Ellen pointed out, what particular strengths are going on there in relation to demonstrating the things that the, um, the different speakers were, were sharing. And I think, Anne, if I may interject, mm. I think um, something that is really... Um, powerful is not only recognizing your own uh, natural style and strengths but as you do that beginning to notice other people's because some of the most happy and successful people as well as some of the easiest people to work with are those who flex their style to the people around them so for example in my case knowing how structured and process driven i am I do try and pick up on the clues uh, about the team that I work with. And if they're not quite as process driven as I am, I try and mellow that down a bit and be a little bit more flexible uh, to the way they would might want to come to solutions, to the way they would like to work so that they would be more comfortable working with me. It's a really interesting point. And one of the one of the takeaways I was hoping to leave people with at the end of this session is, some of you may have had a chance to have a uh, complete the profile and starting to think about it. And I'm very happy that we leave a bit of time at the end if you should have questions about your profiles, because between us, Trudy and I, I'm sure can can help unpack those for you. But it is a really interesting exercise when you take the the strength dictionary that you will get as part of the report, because on that on that dictionary, there are 60 strengths from which the profiles that you end up with are drawn. Um, and actually spending a bit of time strength, strength spotting and watching other people and what they do particularly skillfully and trying to start to recognise what particular strengths they are demonstrating will um, help, as Ellen says, you understand that, you know, we're all different and we have these different groups of strengths in the way that that perhaps means we behave or we prefer, we prefer to approach tasks or, uh, or um, um deliver our work so therefore understanding those people around you as well as understanding your own can really help with kind of harmonize with with how other people tend to operate even if they're quite different to you so we've done the listening for strengths um, this was I was going to revisit the the strengths quadrant because this is what you will receive within your profile you'll know this if you've completed it already and come back to one or two of the points that Trudy was making about the, the strengths quadrant and to illustrate some of these inactions and what the nuances and the differences are between some of them so Trudy talked about the unrealized strengths, for example, being the exciting area of this is where all your, your dormant potential lies, an opportunity that if only you had the opportunity to make use of some of these strengths, it's really good to try and look consciously at what appears in your unrealized strengths profile and think about, OK, so if these are things I'm good at, what opportunities might I find to try and consciously use those unrealized strengths so you're extending the range of strengths that you have from just your realized strengths into the unrealized strengths as well so you have a whole range of, of different things that you will enjoy using so it's flexing those unused muscles where you can. The learned behaviors is a really interesting one because this is what I tend to nickname the duty quadrant. These are, these are proficiencies, these are things that we are perfectly capable of doing, they are simply not things that thrill or energize us. We get the joy from the realized strengths and the unrealized strengths. So spending time in those quadrants, doing those things 
um, and engaging with them is where you're going to have the most fun and make the most contribution and time will pass really quickly if you're using your strengths or your unrealized strengths to complete a task the whole morning will go by and you won't even realize that you were hungry or thirsty and suddenly lunchtime's upon you. You've just been so absorbed in what you've been doing. Um, and that feeling of being in flow and in the moment and in the zone is, is, is a really interesting one to hang on to. In an ideal world, jobs that we go into will have a good chunk of time where we are able to flourish and use those strengths, both the realized and the unrealized where we can. Learned behaviours are the things that every job will have an element of learned behaviours in it because they just are. And if you look at, if you have like me, a to-do list, you will find that the learned behaviours the, 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 relate to the tasks that invariably drop to the end of a busy day. And you haven't perhaps managed quite to get around to doing them because they're really dull. So they're the things you know you've got to do, but actually, you know, you would prefer to be doing other things. So it's not realistic to say that every job will have only realised and unrealised strengths opportunities within them. They'll all have an element of learned behaviours, but hopefully not too many of them. And then the weaknesses, what I love about the strengths profile is this is all about positive psychology. And so the emphasis is much more on your strengths than what you can do. Weaknesses are the things that, frankly, as Trudy says, it's best not to invest time in other than to become basically proficient in order to, to cope with something that you have to get done. Because even if you become better at them, they're probably not likely to budge from learnt behaviours. So you can do them and you might they might become can-dos, but they're probably never going to become love-to-dos. So it's an element of knowing what they are. And I was having a conversation with James last week and we were talking about how he might, we won't personalise this by sharing what James's profile had in it, but there are ways that he could harness, for example, some of his unrealised strengths as workarounds for some of those weaknesses. But what's really neat is that you could perhaps think about the weaknesses that you do have and when you're asked in an interview to give an example of a weakness, lo and behold, you've got two or three examples of actual weaknesses. So maybe pick the one because they're all real and think about, frankly, describing what it is you're not so good at. But also think about what do you do as a, as a workaround for that particular weakness? Are there strengths that you could use from your profile that you could tap into that say, I know, um, for example, in my case, detail is one of my weaknesses. If I have to sit through and read a report and make it accurate, you know, I will do. Invariably, there'll be odd, there'll be the odd error in there because it's just not exciting to me. I'm on to the next project, the next big thing, and the strategy, and not the detail. That doesn't energize me. So I can, you know, I can go through a report, but other people are much better at spotting errors and silly mistakes than I am. So sometimes there's a case for working with people who have complementary strengths to you, so you can offset against one another. So when you're looking collectively as a team. Some of you will have different things to bear and somebody might be really skilled at, at spotting those annoying little errors that you tend to overlook and, and, and gloss over. Um, a difference in terms of illustrating between a learnt behaviour and a realised strength is where your strength sits. So if I have planful and it's a realised strength and somebody in the office says, Anne, would you organise the Christmas party again? My immediate thought would be brilliant, a project. I'm going to love organising this. It's going to be brilliant. Everybody's going to have a fantastic time. And I will organise the event. The coach will arrive on time. The drinks will flow freely. Everybody will have a marvellous time. The music will be really good. Um, and everybody will remember it for a long time afterwards. And I will have had a lot of fun organising it. If, however, a learnt behaviour of mine is planful, then my first thought is one of resentment. Why is it always me that has to organise the Christmas party? But I will organise a perfectly um, great Christmas do in much the same way that the output looks the same. The coach will arrive on time, the booze will flow freely, everybody will have said what a great do it was. But I would not have felt the joy of organising it. And that's the difference. So it's where your strengths sit and where the energy, the accompanying energy comes from that's important to look at. The other thing that I wanted to say is when you find your realised strengths and you're really excited and jumping about thinking, oh, my God, this is brilliant. You know, I've got this lovely array of strengths I can use. Think of it a bit like piano keys. Don't bang them all loudly all at once. It's about melody and harmony. So there is a time and a place for using to the right amount at the right level, the right strengths. If I use my rapport builder all the time, um, to, to engage in small talk with people at a party all night long. I will wear myself out and I will need a break from doing that. And so will everybody else around me probably. So open days are a great example of that. I love an open day, 
But by about four o'clock, I'm exhausted. I've made small talk all day. I've kind of overdone the rapport builder. So I need to put it down and give it a break because if I keep on overplaying it, it will become a learned behavior. So if you overdo a strength, it could drop down and become a learned behavior. Over time, the weaknesses, sadly, are probably the most stable part of the quadrant. And what I find really refreshing is, as you change context and you move through uh, life and different roles, the strength profile will evolve. And so you will find things moving around. So you may find that moving from one job to another enables you to harness and make more use of some of your, of some of your unrealized strengths. And you may discover as you gain more work experience that the strengths that are not even appearing suddenly um, uh, make a, uh, it start to emerge. So I love it because it's dynamic. So this isn't something that this is trying to fix you and say, this is what, who you are and this is what your strengths um, uh, list is. It's a, dy a dynamic thing that will change and evolve over time. And you can consciously maybe pick on a strength from time to time and think about how you might um, hone or practice it to see uh, what it's like to work on it and get better in one or two of the strengths that you see listed. You might need one or two strengths for a particular job. Be interesting to see if you also enjoy them when you get more, um, become more skillful in using them. Um, Another thing I wanted to say is that, of course, we all have our blind spots. So this is a self-assessed report. So it's as good as the person completing it. And we all have our blind spots. And strengths are, um, are one of those things where you may be using strengths without even being aware of it because they feel natural to you and normal. And surely everybody organizes their lives in this way or approaches problems in this particular uh, fashion. That's not necessarily the case. So the things that you feel comfortable doing maybe demonstrating your strengths without you even realizing it. So sometimes you might not notice that you have them. So what's a, a, a fun thing to do is without sharing your profile with one or two people who know you really well, maybe a mentor or a family member or a good friend, is to give them the strengths dictionary and say, if you can only pick seven off this list, which strengths would you use to um, describe me? And I want supporting evidence as well. I don't want just a list. I want to know what you've, what you've observed and what you know about me to tell me what you think. And then compare notes and see what the overlap is like because they might have spotted things you didn't notice or weren't aware of. Or there may be a good degree of correlation, which in itself is also an interesting thing to do. So that is, is, is quite a fun task. And I would recommend that you, you do have a look at that. And the final thing I would say about strengths is they become much more real when you anchor them with evidence. So it's all fine and dandy having a report. Um, you might look at it, think that was nice, and then it gets stuck in a drawer for some long time and you forget you've done it. But if you go through systematically and look at your strengths and identify um, what they do and what they describe, look at the definition, start to put some evidence. Where have you used that particular strength in action? Where could you bring out an example if you were going to uh, a job interview or an internship interview, and if you were asked about your strengths or, or to illustrate um, how you approached a particular problem or task, what could you draw on? Because the more real and more grounded you make the strengths that you have, um, the more confident you'll be in the fact that you do actually have these strengths and the more um, convinced the recruiter will be that you know you were demonstrating these, these things in action. So I'm going to stop there now and I will just quickly move on and finish with this quote and then open it up in case anybody has any questions. I love this quote, I stumbled across it the other day. Always remember you matter, you're important and you are loved and you bring to this world things no one else can. So if you take nothing else away, know that you're unique and your strengths will not be the same as anybody else's um, within the migrant leaders community. There may be some similarities, there may be overlaps, but these are uniquely yours um, and we should be celebrating these um, qualifying them as supporting evidence and enjoying using them in particular your realised and your unrealised strengths. Any questions? Thank you so much, Anne. That was wonderful. Thank you to both um, Trudy and Anne. Uh, very, very enjoyable presentation. Thank you. I am just looking for any questions, um, any hands up from mentors or mentees or speakers and uh, any questions in the chat. Equally to cater for the extroverts, if you prefer to um, speak in person by sharing video and your voice, please feel free to do that.
Ilam, it's a, it's a, a Shia. Uh, I have a question, please, um, for Anna. Of course. I, I remember doing this uh, many years ago, uh, and there was one strength, not sure if it's morphed into another name now, it's called Wu. Ah. Uh, yes, so it probably ages me. <laughs> <laughs> that was the top five, actually. But uh, to your point, uh, this I, I just did the uh, Strength Finder again today, and I compared it to my last set, and things have moved. Ah. And, it, it, it's interesting. My number one strength was responsibility, which is now shifted to number two, and it's been replaced by adventure. And it makes so much sense because what's happened uh, since that time and then is I've raised my hand for almost every opportunity that came along. Uh, new job, new roles, new locations. I, it was just phenomenal. And what I learned about myself was, yeah, just the... the the appet um, appetite, uh, the risk appetite to stepping into that new place. Yes, there are some transferable skills, but hey, there's runway. And yes. uh, the discussion earlier um, around, yes, your degree is helpful, but it's just, uh, it just demonstrates your ability to learn, uh, your commitment to the cause and so forth. But uh, thereafter, everything is up for, um, uh, you know, is up and negotiable. So absolutely. Me, it's been very insightful. So I just want to say thank you so much for sharing that uh, with the the, uh, the Ilham and her team. Uh, it's a pleasure, and it's it's great to hear your your take on things as well, and and to demonstrate that things do shift, so they're not static. Mm -hmm. Things evolve, and it's all to play for. Yes, it's uh, it's interesting, Ashia. You mentioned um, your appetite for risk. Uh, and why uh, your strengths in such an assessment might shift over time. Um, I think um, so many of our young mentees, um, the first and second generation migrants, and like myself and some of our migrant leaders' mentors, they have gone through a lot of adversity early on in their lives. And sometimes uh, the learned behavior and the response to adversity um, sometimes is for a decade or so for us to become a little bit risk averse. Mm -hmm. But then gradually when the environment shifts and our brains adjust and we realize that we are no longer in the previous um, unstable environment adversity, we begin to uh, relax a little bit and realize that actually we are not that risk averse by character and that uh, we are comfortable um, um, utilizing some of our natural strengths and perhaps become more adventurous. Uh, go to New York, for example, in your case. Or, you know, uh, you, we begin to show attributes that we didn't realize we have. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And some of this is um, we learn, we pick up. Um, I think the conversation earlier around um, the cultural nuance. I mean, I'm from Pakistani background. You know, there are many religious, cultural, you know, th there are all sorts of parameters which uh, are there should you choose to stay within that. I mean, I, I was very fortunate, my family uh, forward leaning and encouraged travel, go do, go do. So, uh, and that's not to say that the society and the community didn't have their views on things, and they did, but uh, we, we said thank you and carried on doing what we wanted to do. So uh, it did, for me, I mean, my backstory is this. Uh, I am a reformed banker <laughs> who went on to, uh, went on to uh, help companies tell their stories to a bunch of stakeholders, uh, which included employees, shareholders and the broader communities at large. I have uh, worked in financial services, so I've done the merchant banking, investment banking, commercial banking, uh, great institutions such as Credit Suisse, Lazards, National Australia Bank. Uh, Standard Chartered actually was my last bank and that opportunity took me around the world. Um, and I since uh, my last role was at MetLife, a, a global insurer. But it's uh, every step of the way, uh, and it plays to my key strength, which was adventure. Um, raising my hand says, yes, there were skills always trans transferable, but what I didn't lose was my appetite to learn. And every step of the way, kept that front and center, knew nothing about insurance, but I thought, I'll learn. I'll learn how to read their financials, and it sort of positioned me a little differently. So I think this uh, step, um, the strength finder is a great insight. It helps the building, it helps put place those building blocks as you move forward in your career. But 
I, I, I saw no limitations and I, you know, it's easy to say on my side, but well, I'll, I think Rupert touched on it earlier. When you are in the zone, it's passion and there's real energy around what you're doing. And uh, Giovanni, is it Giovanni mentioned it earlier. Uh, you know, that, that's where you're, you're truly at your best self. So once you find those roles, you know, press on. I think it's a really interesting activity to do it. And then every couple of years, I tried it out with a group of um, higher education academic leaders recently um, and they wanted to try it. Um, they did it last year and we were supposed to deliver the session um, and then the pandemic hit and suddenly I was delivering a virtual session, getting to grips with Teams and Zoom and everything as we all were. Um, and then they said, actually, let's do it again a year on to see what had happened. And it was astonishing just how much had changed in their profiles potentially I suspect down to circumstance and having to work very differently and I'm not sure in a normal year and Trudy might want to come in here how much that would be expected to be quite so turbulent in terms of the amounts of differences that we saw in those profiles but it was quite an eye-opener for me. Yeah and a great question um, Anne and it was something I was also going to mention around um, strengths changing over time you know they're not labels for life um, and what that's what's really exciting about the tool is that when you think about performance, that can be a little bit more stable, but your energy and how often you're doing things is absolutely open to change. And if you get your profile and it's not, oh, you know, there's one or two in there you weren't quite happy with, you wanted something different, then go and get them. <laughs> it's, it's yours in terms of the, you know, the openness to development. And I think, you know, Anne, thank you for, for raising the sort of the, the pandemic. What we saw was a huge increase in the strength of growth. It just off the scale just went berserk uh, over the 12 month period because of course we've all had to learn new skills and learn it in a new way. Mm. On the opposite side of that, um, you know, time optimizer became our biggest weakness. <laughs> <laughs> overnight, you know, I mean, some of you are smiling, thinking, yep, that's me, headless chicken running around, you know, managing everything and everyone and children at school and all sorts of things from home. So, um, and focus and all those things. So, you know, knowing this can then really obviously help how we think about directing our strengths, but they're not here for, you know, they're not a label for life, but I've got 15 profiles over 12 years um, and my top seven, four do remain with me pretty consistently. Yeah. They're like an arm, you know, I'm yeah. not going to know. I might lose other things. Remember, the average is about 19 when you look at the bigger profile. So I might lose some creativity, but I never lose my mission. I never lose my humour. I never use my counterpoint and I never lose my persuasion. So they're sort of, you know, they're my inherent ones that are with me for life. So you'll go on that story and it's, a, you know, a great example. Thank you for sharing how it's, you know, your development journey is yours to pick going forward. And it's about the right, as Anne said, you know, this harmony, the right strength at the right time for the right purpose. The, um, the, the storytelling we were looking at earlier, I think it's really interesting because we will all have various versions of our story. There's the kind of what I call the slick above the waterline version that's the kind of PR spin version of success. And of course, we all know that life is just not like that. If you look at most of us, and I did contemplate whether or not we might do the lifeline exercise where you look at the highs and lows of your career, where you go up and where you go down. And I tell you what, mine was one massive up and down kind of zigzag as I was going through early school and into into career before I sort of settled down and then there was more turbulence again later so there's the kind of what you learn from telling your story and what you can also pull in from your strengths profile and from those different questions that I raised earlier on which I'm happy to share with Ellen in case anybody wants to kind of dip into those again and give some more thoughts to games early influences books role models and so on because it will help you craft and retell your story and the version of the narrative that you tell over time will evolve and change as you do, and it becoming becomes richer as well. Yeah, a great point, Anna. The only bit I'd add on to that is, um, in the world of Catfinity, we work with the graduate recruiters, um, and we we you know, own their sort of end-to-end -end recruitment. And what we are looking for is those signs that Anne shared. You know, they are what we as recruiters will be looking for when we're looking at strengths. We're looking for your detail. Don't tell us about a strength. Yeah, one of my strengths. You know, that's just not going to score for us as a strength. We want to see passion. We want to see motivation. We want to see tone. We want to see excitement. And we want detail. We want growth. We want you to volunteer stories. You know, so it's it's really important. And obviously, you know, this is experienced higher on strengths-based recruitment, not just graduate higher. But, you know, they're the signs that we're looking for that tell us you're going to be a great fit for, for, for that organisation. 
Trudy, what what a great way of illustrating and demonstrating um, their strengths through telling their life stories. And I know that my uh, colleague Fozia Hart um, from Migrant Leaders has got um, great stories uh, and um, uh, and lessons from her own life to share as well. And I don't know, Fozia, if you'd like to take some time sharing a, yeah. a couple of your stories. Yeah, and really this is just picking up on everything that the last three speakers have just said. And I just wanted to give a couple of examples of how, um, perhaps with a lot of hindsight, I've now realised that I've used or identified strength and then use those to make decisions. Um, and two major points that I did that in my life was one, when I decided to change, <laughs> this is a repeat story, um, and doing an accountancy degree, the degree I eventually did. So yeah, another uh, lapsed accountant. Um, and again, and that choice was made because of the family rules. You know, I was one of six children and, you know, we needed a doctor and an accountant and a lawyer and da 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 da. So, um, was that you know, um, when I had an opportunity and unfortunately that opportunity came out of um, tragedy it, it, you know it was an opportunity for me to actually sit and reflect what I was doing and what I was going to do in the future figured out what I was enjoying what I was getting real joy from and decided to shift my degree more towards that than the accountancy that I had been doing because and the way I, I sort of you know to myself about it was you know what I wasn't interested in how much a cabbage was going to cost it was just not what I was interested in so eventually what I changed my degree to what and that I was going to enjoy and as it turned out through my career that has become a vocational degree social policy so that was one major life decision then more recent one not so major well, some people might think it was, I didn't at the time. But actually, I was doing a job that I wasn't really enjoying. Um, it was a project management job. And <laughs> and then, again, thinking about my strengths and my skills and my natural inclination to do things, um, I kind of just slowly and subtly shifted the job towards what I wanted it to be, and kind of shifted to one side the bits that I wasn't really enjoying. Now, I was lucky. <laughs> skills confidence and the ability to do that and just sell it and you know we really need this so I'm going to spend my time doing this and persuaded people that's what I was going to do and that was basically picking up on all of my skills figuring out what I what parts of my job I enjoyed how I could communicate with people how I could share and it was important stuff to do I wasn't just making it up because we actually needed to share regulatory um, requirements to be able to do our job effectively um, so you know just looking at your strengths figuring out what it is you enjoy finding the importance of that as well making it you know, justifying what you're doing relating it to the organization that you're working in, and then shifting just for me was a really important factor and again it was just one of those things that you did it wasn't conscious just kind of did it and then, you know, as I said, with hindsight, you kind of reflect on what you did and then figure out, actually, yeah, that's what I was doing because that's what I'm good at. So just think about that. Thanks I guess for sharing. Fosia, that's really good. Um, I guess, Fosia, um I see four circles. Um, one is what do the people in the organisation I am in, what do they logically need for the organisation to succeed? And what do those people emotionally need? Because those are two different things. And then what am I logically good at and strong at? And what do I need emotionally? These are four circles. And personally, I always try and find the, if, can I find a common area among these four circles? And if the answer is no, I leave that organization and those set of people immediately. Because if there is no common area between those four circles, there's well, never going to be any consensus. As you know, um, after I did, I then did move <laughs> away from that organisation. So, you know, and that was a big factor in me working with you full time rather than struggling to part time. I was trying to make you find your circles. 
<laughs> and bring you to my circle, which I'm delighted and honoured to say we managed to do. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I'm finding it a very fulfilling circle to be in with you. And it is a joy to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great when we, we, we are doing things that matches our purpose and matches our skills? Really a joy with people we actually like working with. <laughs> So, so with that in mind, I, I wonder if uh, in the last five minutes, um, any of the mentees have any further questions that um, they um, remain to ask before we close the session and uh, before I close, I, I thank everyone. I am just looking for questions um, or any hands up. Okay, I am, I must say I am proud of our young mentees who have remained in the conference right until the end. And that is quite a great uh, considering um, uh, that young people tend not to do that. So, so whatever we did guys really worked and the young people must have found it interesting, engaging and informative. So with that in mind, I really would like to thank our speakers, our experts, um, you know, Anne, Trudy, Giovanni, and all our migrant leaders mentors who joined and gave up their valuable time tonight. I'm eternally grateful. Um, and uh, really, uh, we are doing something special together here in the form of Migrant Leaders Charity. I would encourage all our mentors to think about their professional networks within their organizations or outside their organizations. And if they have any recommendations or want to introduce anyone to me as potential mentors, feel free to introduce to me by email or on LinkedIn. And I would say to our young mentees, uh, go and spread the word about the Migrant Leaders Development Program. As you know, it's free of charge. You can see that we've got wonderful mentors and corporates and others supporting us. Um, spread the word among other young people, check our migrant leaders website, uh, encourage them to um, apply as candidates, migrantleaders.org.uk. And everyone, if you're not already connected with me on LinkedIn, feel free to send me connection invites so that we can continue our conversations. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>